My name is Jordan Heath Rawlings. I'm on a mission to help Canadians navigate their finances. Join me on In This Economy as I help you understand the systems behind your money problems so you can finally start thriving even in these unpredictable times. Listen to In This Economy at the Frequency Podcast Network or wherever you get your podcasts. Find your frequency. This is The Big Story Plus. Enjoy your ad-free podcast. You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. Each day in the Israel-Hamas conflict brings us terrible news about innocent civilians endangered, killed, more atrocities, no hint of an end to the violence. Each day, right here in Canada, the conflict frays and tears at our own sense of safety, of unity and peaceful coexistence. Montreal police investigating after two Jewish schools in Montreal were hit with gunshots overnight. One located on St. Kevin Avenue in Cote d'Ange and the other on Chemin Deacon in Outremont. Both Edmonton police and Edmonton public schools confirm a man in a vehicle was shouting anti-Palestinian rhetoric and swearing at students outside the school Monday morning. A teacher who witnessed it brought the students back in and called police. It's a spillover of violence from the Middle East that Canadian communities are seeing as well. In Toronto, there have been 14 hate crimes reported in the last couple of weeks. The hate crimes and the violence are the most obvious examples. But the extreme emotions attached to this conflict are riling campuses forcing us to confront the nature of what free speech means in Canada and pitting colleagues and friends against one another in ways that would have been unfathomable just over a month ago. Until some sort of ceasefire is found, the terror and death isn't likely to stop. But as a country that has long told itself, probably falsely, that we are better than this kind of hate, the question is how much ugliness, how much Islamophobia and anti-Semitism are we willing to allow here? How can any kind of dialogue arise from the extremes that we are seeing right now? I'm Jordan Heath Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Dr. Mira Sukarov is a professor of political science at Carleton University. She specializes in Israeli-Palestinian relations. Hello, Dr. Sukarov. Hello. I know there are far too many for us to run through here, sadly, but maybe to begin, can you summarize uh, some of the incidents we've seen here in Canada since the conflict began? A mosque in Ottawa had feces spread on its door. A Jewish school in Montreal has been shot at with guns and bullets uh, multiple times in the middle of the night. There is a serious spike in hate crimes against Jewish communities and Muslim communities since October 7th, and the numbers are far higher than they were at the same time last year. You work at a university, and I know campuses have been hotbeds for some of the more controversial speech around this, uh, some of the protests. What's the general feeling or or fears uh, that you've heard from people on campus, be they uh, Muslims or Jews? Well, when I've interviewed or met with senior administration at Carleton to see how I can be of help as the, as one of the main subject experts at Carleton, they report to me that each community, sort of representatives from each side, so to speak, are saying very similar things to them. One of the things that's happening on campuses is that the posters of each side are being ripped down. Mm-hmm. And for example, there's a poster campaign that's gone on among Jewish communities outside of Israel and in Israel, pro-Israel communities of pictures of hostages that have been taken by Hamas who are sitting in captivity in the Gaza Strip. And when so-called the other side, so-called tears these down, Jewish communities feel like it's an act of anti-Semitism. So part of the thing we have to work out is whether we're seeing anti-Israel sentiment or anti-Semitic sentiment. There's always a fine line between the two. There's always debates and controversies over what is a political act opposing 
the Israeli state or opposing Israeli policies or even opposing Zionism, and what is an act of hatred against Jews, which is what we call anti-Semitism. So part of the problem, part of the challenge is uh, discerning between the two. But when synagogues are attacked, when Jewish school kids in Toronto are harassed with threatening language, which is what happened soon after October 7th near the Jewish high school in Toronto, those are clearly acts of anti-Semitism, mm-hmm. even if they're motivated by anti-Israel sentiment. There has been a lot of condemnation of hate crimes against both Muslim and Jewish communities. And Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has appointed uh, a representative to combat anti-Semitism the same way we've already got one appointed to combat Islamophobia. What do those positions do? Are they ceremonial? Uh, What can be done at that level of government, if anything, to try to help make members of both communities feel safe? I think the appointment of special representatives for these kinds of hatreds are very useful in a couple of ways. One is in signaling to Canadians that this is a priority. And so that does two things. It can deter hateful Canadians from being hateful. And it also serves to support and nurture communities who feel under threat. And that both those things hand in hand, I think are very important in in, uh, standing up for Canadian values and expressing Canadian values. The other thing special representatives can do is to be very much on the ground speaking and listening to communities under threat and hearing what their concerns are, and then liaising with whether it's uh, law enforcement agencies or governments to consider new kinds of legislation. For example, we know that three provinces at least so far have adopted Holocaust education as a mandatory part of the curriculum. And I mean, this is very close to my heart. So just for, for listeners to give a sense, I'm 51. And so I was a high school student in um, the late 80s. And I noticed as a high school student in BC at the time, I was in Vancouver, that the only way to learn about the Holocaust is if you took an elective, history Mm -hmm. grade 12, which I did. And that really bothered me. So I tried sort of single-handedly to try to get legislation like this passed. I was only in high school, so I didn't get very far. But I do recall networking with Holocaust education representatives, trying to get my own history teacher on board unsuccessfully to sign a petition that I had granted. So, you know, sometimes patience is important. And now that kind of legislation has been enacted in my lifetime and that feels good to me. Mm -hmm. But so patience for activists is important, but uh, counseling patients for communities directly under threat is not usually a, a very kind thing to do. So that's why it's good to do things quickly, but at the same time, realize that things can happen in one's lifetime. In terms of the prevalence of hate crimes and hate threats, you mentioned that uh, police have reported that they've been up from last year since the conflict began. Have they been rising in terms of Islamophobic or anti-Semitic incidents? Have they been rising in recent years? I'm trying to figure out if this is, you know, a sudden spike due to this conflict or if there is a steadily rising increase, as, as I think we've seen in the United States. I believe there is a steadily rising increase, but I don't have strong data on that. When I'm more noticing is the spike since October 7th compared to last year. But certainly communities feel more under threat. They feel more protective, um, both Jewish and Muslim communities. And, you know, we're talking here in one sense about separate communities, and they are separate. Well, of course, some people are are both. So, of course, the communities aren't totally mutually exclusive. Mm-hmm. But insofar as they mostly are, we're talking about them at, in isolation. And what I also really hope to see, and this is what I'm trying to do on campus is to get a task force that can connect both communities in a dialogue sense. So because in a sense, the hatred is in some ways two sides of the same coin. What we're seeing in many ways is a an exporting of the conflict from Israel-Palestine into our communities in Canada. And I think no one is safe until everyone is safe. And even though both communities in a, some senses feel under threat by the other, there is also a sense in which both communities are under threat by forces outside of them. So white supremacy is a threat to both Muslims and to Jews. Yeah. And so if there's a way we can band together across communities that can help douse the flames of white supremacy, there's also a sense in which both communities feel misunderstood by the other. I mean, I can give you an example. For example, the, the chant we're hearing uh, from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free is chanted by members of uh, the Palestinian community and those standing in solidarity with Palestinians and is heard very differently by many members of the Jewish community, Mm -hmm. notwithstanding that some Jews 
attend Palestine solidarity rallies, and some Jews chant the phrase. But we can talk a little bit about, for example, how that phrase is meant by many in one way and heard by many others in a different way. I want to use that as an example, actually, to talk about a couple of things here. Can you explain the phrase and what it means to each side and the significance of it? It started in the 1960s as a phrase of Palestine liberation in Palestine, markedly through the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization. Most recently, it has been codified in the 2017, so it's not so long ago, the 2017 Hamas Charter. And because it's now uh, been codified in the 2017, which is a revised Hamas Charter, revised from 1988, many Jews hear it when it's said today, particularly in the wake of October 7th, Many Jews hear it as Palestinians and Palestine solidarity supporters dancing on the graves of the 1,200 Jews, Israelis, who, not all of whom were Jewish, but almost all of whom were Jewish, who were murdered by Hamas in the October 7th massacre of Israelis. Now, of those 1,200, the majority of them are civilians. Some of them were Israeli military targets. A pro-Palestinian activist was uh, caught on camera uh, shouting the phrase, encouraging others to chant it with him at a rally in Calgary. Uh, He was arrested and part of his crime uh, had a, a hate modification added to it. You know, when we talk about how we combat these rising hate crimes... It is one thing to say that obviously, you know, uh, people smear feces on a mosque or or shoot at a Jewish school. Like, you have to react to these things. Where is the line uh, between that and reacting to something like this, which is seen differently on both sides and could also perhaps rightly be seen as simple free speech? Uh, I I think it's it's getting really blurry out there right now for people, and, and there's so many emotions involved. Yeah, a couple of things. So when we think about free speech, we Canada is not the U.S. Right. The U.S. has First Amendment, which is a very, very expansive view of the kind of speech that is allowed. Canada does have a principle of free speech, but we have more robust hate speech laws. Mm-hmm. So our concept of speech is somewhat more limited than it is in, let's say, the U.S. So we do have hate speech laws and we do have to be on the lookout for hateful speech. When I hear a slogan like Palestine shall be free from the river to the sea, it is not at all clear to me that that is a case of hate speech. There is some ambiguity to it. And I understand that Jews, many Jews hear a call for ethnic cleansing of Jews from Israel. Many Jews hear a call for genocide from Jews from the state of Israel and the land between the river and the sea. But many Palestinians, and I would say most Palestinians, when they say it, mean a level of freedom for the residents who live between the river and the sea, a level of freedom that is not currently enjoyed by all. So that might mean a one-state solution. It might mean some other arrangement. But of course, if they do intend to call for ethnic cleansing of Jews from Palestine, that would be hateful to me, to my ears. And I think part of the problem is that it is an ambiguous phrase. But also part of the challenge of any political slogan is that it is going to be more concise than one uh, than it should be to really be clear. Now, five years ago, Mark Lamont Hill, who was who is a professor at Temple University in Philadelphia, had a gig on CNN and he uttered that phrase in the course of his activism. He uttered the phrase, Palestine shall be free from the river to the sea. And he was summarily fired from CNN. At the time, this was in 2018, I wrote a piece in Haaretz, the Israeli Daily, and I said that it's not hateful, that phrase, but ideally what Mark Lamont Hill should have said, I wrote at the time, was from the river to the sea, all Israelis and all Palestinians shall be free. So I think part of the challenge is when you focus it on human lives and human rights, which uh, there's enough rights to go around always. And so if you make it a human rights call, then there's no good rebuttal that it, there's no good faith way that it could ever be seen as hateful. When it's tied to the land, it gets a little trickier. So what do we mean that the land shall be free? Free of what? Is it free of oppression? That's not hateful. Free of rights violations? That's not hateful. Is it free of Jews? And that's what Jews, many Jews are hearing. And here's another challenge. We, or another predicament or dilemma, it's not for those on the receiving end of a chant for freedom to tell people how to chant. 
On the other hand, many Jews say, well, this is a matter of impact versus intent, just like much of the anti-racist discourse has taught us that how things are heard is more important than how thing, than the intention that people had when they said it. Now, this works, I think, very well when it's a community that's oppressed being told something or hearing something from a community that's not oppressed. So if a white person says, can I touch your hair to a black person, black person might take that as racist. And I think that is their right. So we have to hear, think about impact versus intent. The case of Israel and Palestine is very different. Israelis on the whole are not oppressed by Palestinians. The reverse is the case. Palestinians in the West Bank are under Israeli military occupation. Palestinians in Gaza are under uh, Israeli blockade. But in Canada, Jews and Palestinians are both, both face oppression and both face systemic racism to a certain extent from the state. Jews and Muslims both have to face down Christian heteronormativity, for example. Mm -hmm. And Jews are under threat of anti-Semitism. Palestinians are under threat of Palestinian anti-Palestinian racism, and Muslims are under threat of Islamophobia. So in a sense, it depends where these kinds of statements are being uttered. But I will say one more thing, and that is in Israel-Palestine, as of October 7th, I mean, I believe the direction of oppression is still quite clear that the that Israel has the military administration, the military occupation uh, regime going on in the West Bank and, and enacts a blockade with the help of Egypt and Gaza and now a much fuller siege. But on the morning of October 7th, it was Israelis who were being massacred directly by Hamas. Was this a genocide? I don't think it rises to the level of genocide, but was it genocidal behavior? I would say, yes, it was on the part of Hamas. It was a war crime. It was a crime against humanity. So the timing is also really important. Another dilemma is that Israel went in right after the massacre of October 7th and started bombing ferociously Gaza, including many Gaza civilians. So now Palestinians can say that there is a, a massacre and carnage in Gaza. So it depends what spotlight you're using and when as to who feels the most under threat at any given moment. Thank you for that. And I want to ask you now about how Canadians can approach how divisive this is. And I, and I ask that because, um, as you say, it depends on what spotlight you're looking at. I have seen lots of uh, Jewish Canadians, you know, speaking out saying, I'm really noticing who is who among my friend group is standing up for Israel and who is supporting me. And on the other side, um, I've seen lots of uh, Muslim Canadians, Palestinian Canadians saying, you know, it's really easy to look around now at my white friends and see who is marching in the protests and who is shouting the slogans and who is really there for us. And I think there are a lot of Canadians right now caught in the middle because we are such a multicultural country. I know I have both Muslim and Jewish friends. I'm sure many other people do. And as somebody who specializes in, in relations between these two groups and the emotions around them, how can Canadians navigate this conflict as it appears in their daily lives, even as obviously horrific things are happening overseas? I think the best way, the most straightforward way is for Canadians, whether they're Jewish, Palestinian, Muslim, or none of the above, to engage in values-based discussion about it. So what are your values? Are your values the protection of human life? Are your values human dignity? Are your values uh, human rights and civil rights? If so, what do we need to do to ensure that all Palestinians and all Israelis in Israel-Palestine have those rights, that everyone feels safe, that everyone has a sense of both individual and collective safety, that no one's dignity is being infirmed by policies of, let's say, a, a military occupation. Mm -hmm. And so it's very important to condemn the massacre of October 7th. What Hamas did was a crime against humanity. It was a war crime. And what Israel is doing now in Gaza, collective punishment is a crime, a war crime. Cutting off food, fuel, medicine, and water to Gazans is a war crime. And one has to talk about international humanitarian law. For example, the principle of needing to distinguish between civilians and combatants and needing to exert force that is proportional to the military target. No more force that is necessary to attain your military goal. These are the principles that should guide us when we look at Gaza. I mean, it, it, the latter two principles, distinction and proportionality, involve some degree of interpretation. And so, but at least we can talk in terms of principles and laws and assess things that way. It, the, the conversation becomes a little less brittle. 
But I feel a lot of Canadians are maybe being asked to pick a side. And it, it is um, well and good to say we should all express support for human life and the preservation of life on both sides. But, you know, the reality of this conflict is, is incredibly divisive and everything from hate crimes on the extreme end to making things uh, incredibly awkward is too small a word here. But do you know what I'm saying? That this conflict is having impacts on daily life in this country. The side that we pick has to be the side of Canadian values. If we're talking about Canada, it has to be the side of human rights, civil rights, protection of human life, protection of dignity. Mm, and yeah. that, that that is the side that we need to side with. And then we need to examine whether it's an attack, as you said, an attack on a synagogue, harassment of Jewish kids, whether it's harassment of Muslim women wearing a hijab, mm -hmm. whether it's attack on a mosque, those are against Canadian values. Those are against the values of human dignity and civil rights and human rights. And we have to stand against that together as Canadians. The last thing I want to ask you is what happens next? And is there anything that would calm the rise in hate that we're seeing, um, certainly in Canada, as we've discussed, in other countries in the world where this conflict is equally emotional? If a ceasefire was announced in the coming days, it feels like maybe there's no way to put the genie back in the bottle and, and this conflict is out there now in a way it hasn't been, but, but maybe not. What comes next here? Well, a ceasefire would enable Palestinian lives to be protected in Gaza. There would be no more killing of Palestinians as of a ceasefire, at least at that moment, and that would be important. There's also 240 hostages that Hamas has ca in captivity in Gaza that need to be returned. Taking civilian hostages especially is a war crime. There are also Palestinians sitting in Israeli jails, many of whom are there without having had the democratic right to due process because they're not citizens or even a full residents of, of the state of Israel. They're under occupation and have been taken by the Israeli military authorities. That is not a military that represents them. That is not their state military. They've been taken and put in Israeli prisons. A hostage trade between those kinds of Palestinian prisoners and the hostages taken by Hamas might be in the cards and that might be a just way to release the hostages and release Palestinian prisoners. But here in Canada, we have to make sure that the conflict doesn't spill over to our own communities. Mm -hmm. We all live under the benefits of a democratic state. We need to protect our, each other. We need to protect our own communities. And I really would love to see, and this isn't going to be done by legislative fiat. This would be done by by modeling dialogue to get these communities into dialogue with each other. And I'll just say one more thing for your listeners, and that is dialogue is sometimes viewed as a dirty word among Palestine solidarity supporters or among Palestinians because the thinking goes that the, the power disparity between Israel and the Palestinians is so great that it is unrealistic to call for dialogue. Instead, many Palestinians urge co-resistance and so I think it is very important if communities want to engage in dialogue with each other, for those feeling like they are connected or on the side of Israel here in Canada to acknowledge that Palestinian rights within the West Bank, within Gaza, and to an extent, much lesser extent, but there still is inequality within Israel proper between Jewish and Palestinian citizens of Israel, that rights have to be respected. So you have to go in with a baseline idea that rights need to be respected. Everyone needs to, de everyone deserves the right to individual and collective safety, human and civil rights. And then you can start talking more effectively here in Canada. Dr. Sukarov, thank you so much for this. Um, really insightful. I have a better grasp on what's going on here at home now. You're welcome. Dr. Mira Sukarov, Professor of Political Science at Carleton University. That was The Big Story. For more, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca to give us some feedback on this episode, I'm sure some of you would like to. You can easily do so on Twitter at the Big Story FPN. You can do it by sending an email to hello at the Big Story Podcast.ca. And you can do it by calling us and leaving a voicemail. That number is 416 935 5935. A reminder that our new show, In This Economy, has new episodes every Thursday, which is today. This week, we'll tell you. How to afford a car in this economy? Yes. So you can pop over to that feed and subscribe and follow right there for free to get all that new stuff too. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. Thanks for listening. We'll talk tomorrow.